In our last two videos, we learned about neurons and neurotransmitters, two of the brain's most important communicators that allow for things like thought. In this video, we're going to get a little bit bigger to talk about the lobes of the brain and some other really important brain structures that we care about as psychologists. Now, there's going to be a good bit of anatomy to talk about in this video, but I'm really going to try and focus on, again, the structures that have implications, uh, at least the most significant implications, for psychology. So let's jump right into it. We're going to talk a lot in the first half of the video about the cerebral cortex, which is sort of the major part of the brain. If you think about a brain or you look at a brain, the cerebral cortex is what you're looking at. So it's your typical sort of idea of what a brain is and what it looks like. Now, the job of the cerebral cortex is to analyze sensory information. What is this? This means what you can see, what you can smell, what you can touch. All of that is sort of broken apart and analyzed in the cerebral cortex. Now, the cerebral cortex is split into four different lobes, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and two cerebral hemispheres, your right and left hemisphere. You can think, for example, when people have said you're right-brained versus left-brained, which is actually not a super great distinction. Not a lot of evidence for that, but in any case, that's a whole nother can of worms. The cerebral hemispheres, the right and left, are connected by the corpus callosum, and I'll give you a close-up of what that looks like. So right in the middle here, the corpus callosum is essentially just this band of fibers that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. But let's get on to the four lobes of the brain. There's the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal, and occipital lobes. Let's go through each in turn, starting with the frontal lobe. Here's an image of the frontal lobe. It's called that because it literally sits in front of your brain. It sits about an inch or maybe a little bit less than an inch underneath your forehead, and you can see it's a large part of your brain. Here's another image if you want some context within the sort of skull so you can see where in the head this lies. The frontal lobe has lots of really important structures. In reality, all the structures of our brain are important. Without any of them, we're going to have impairments, but the frontal lobe is really, really important. The frontal lobe is responsible for motor function, so the ability to move your body, language, being able to speak and, and whatnot, communicate. I'll get to that more in just a moment. It's also important for memory and for planning. Now, in terms of planning, the reason it's important for planning is because it houses what we call the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, which is even sort of further in front of your frontal lobe. Now, this is important for executive function, something that psychologists study a lot because it has lots of really important implications for human behavior. Executive function is inhibitory control. It's your ability to plan out your actions, to think before you speak or think before you act, right? To look at different ways you could act, different things you could possibly say, evaluate and kind of see what you would expect the consequences of each course of action to be and select the appropriate response. Okay, that's executive function. That's important uh, because, again, it has implications for human behavior and also it's part of the frontal lobe. Now, let's get back to that bit about language. The frontal lobe houses Broca's area, part of it, as you can see here, and Broca's area is important for language production. Now, keep in mind production versus what we'll get to in another uh, area of the brain, Wernicke's area, which is important for language comprehension. These two are often confused, and students, for example, have a hard time remembering which which is Broca's area and which is Wernicke's area. Broca's area is important for language production, meaning the ability to speak out loud, to get the words out that you want to say. So if you hear somebody who has damage to this area of the brain, to Broca's area, they end up with what's called Broca's aphasia. And again, they have an inability to produce language the way they wish they could. What this often looks like is if you hear somebody talk with Broca's aphasia, it'll sound like this. I, uh, the, right, you can really hear them struggling to figure out the words that they want to communicate. Now, they know what they want to communicate. The meaning is in their head, but they just can't find the words to get that information across. So keep that in mind before we get in just a little while to Wernicke's area, which is a little bit different. So that's the important information you need to know about the frontal lobe. Let's now talk about the parietal lobe. 
So the frontal lobe is in front. The parietal lobe sits right behind the frontal lobe. Here's another image in the context of the skull in case that's helpful. The parietal lobe also has a lot of really important functions, but very different functions. The parietal lobe is important for touch perception and some visual perception as well, as I'll mention in a moment, but it's not the main vision center of our brain. That's a different lobe that I'll get to in a few slides. The parietal lobe also helps us to track an object's location, shape, and orientation. This is the vision bit. And it helps us to process other people's actions to understand why they behaved in that sort of a way. And finally, to represent numbers. It's important for counting and for math, right? So look at this one lobe and the varied sort of responsibilities and tasks this one lobe has. I think it's really fascinating. Damage to the parietal lobe can sometimes result in what's called hemispatial neglect. In reality, there's lots of different things that can happen, but this is one uh, relatively common sort of disorder that we see. Now, what is hemispatial neglect? This means sort of neglecting one half of your visual hemisphere, right? One half, either the right or the left visual field, sort of neglecting that. It's not like your eyes are messed up, but you just might not be able to attend to, meaning pay attention to, that half of your visual field. And how do we test this? Well, we can draw out a circle for somebody who has hemispatial neglect, and we could say, this is a clock with no numbers. Write the numbers on the clock. Now, for most people, this would be a relatively simple task. We'd put 12 up at the top, 6 at the bottom, and we'd fill out the rest without too much trouble. But for somebody with hemispatial neglect, they can't focus on one half of what they're seeing, so they often do something that looks like this. All right, so clearly they're only focusing on sort of one half of what they're seeing. It's really fascinating and, again, kind of debilitating. It's hard to deal with that. But in any case, we'll move on to the temporal lobe next. So let's talk about that. The temporal lobe sits just beneath the parietal lobe, again, behind the frontal lobe. Here's the uh, second skull view. The temporal lobe is important for hearing which we may talk about more when we get to sensation and perception, time permitting, understanding language, and storing memories of our past. So understanding language, this is where we get to Wernicke's area. This is important for language comprehension, not production. And damage to Wernicke's area can result in what we call Wernicke's aphasia. Now, if you hear somebody talking who has Wernicke's aphasia, it's very different than what someone sounds like when they have Broca's aphasia. Wernicke's aphasia is also sometimes called fluent aphasia because if you didn't understand the language, they would sound perfectly fluent. Somebody with Wernicke's aphasia can talk normally. They have their, you know, they have all the words at their disposal. They'll have the proper intonation. They won't have lots of awkward pauses. They'll sound just like anybody else. But the difference is what comes out of their mouth is essentially gibberish. Sure, it might be English words, but it's English words that have no relation to anything else going on or even to each other within the same sentence. It's, a, it's essentially gibberish. So it sounds fluent, but again, it's a lack of understanding. They have trouble sort of attaching the meanings to the appropriate words. All right, last but not least, let's talk about the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe sits at the very back of the brain. It's a relatively small portion of the brain, but notice it's still a sizable portion. And this is kind of notable because it's responsible for vision and pretty much only vision. And this is just a testament to how we as humans are such visual creatures. We have such a relatively large portion of our brains dedicated to this really important skill of being able to see. All right, I wanna switch gears and talk about three more structures that are a little bit different. These are structures in the limbic system, which again are really important for psychology. So let's get into it. First, we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a structure in the brain responsible for regulating internal body states. For example, hunger, thirst, sexual motivation, and other emotional behaviors. So for each of these, I really encourage you, by the way, to think about what application this might have to the field of psychology. Hunger, thirst, sexual motivation, emotional behaviors more generally. Some of these, by the way, will return. This isn't just anatomy for anatomy's sake. We're going to talk about specific content areas later. 
for example, like memory. We'll have a whole series of videos on memory, and one of these structures is going to be really important for memory, just to foreshadow. All right, next we have the amygdala. This is sort of the emotion center of the brain, sometimes also called the fear center of the brain. The amygdala is a structure responsible for excitement, arousal, and fear. If we put somebody in a brain scanner, for example, and we have them play violent video games or watch a clip of a horror movie, the amygdala lights up. Finally, we have the hippocampus. This is the important structure for memory. So the hippocampus is important for just general memory, storing memories of our past, forming new memories so that they can be stored uh, uh, in other areas of the brain, actually, I should say. But it's also very important for spatial memory, meaning being able to understand and sort of get a map of your environmental layout. So if you know, for example, how to walk from your apartment to campus or how to walk to your grocery store or your favorite fast food place, that is something you can thank your hippocampus for. So I know this is a lot of anatomy, like I said, it's a lot of information, but try and keep it in mind as much as possible as we move forward because these different brain structures will come up in the context of other specific content areas.